o universo absoluto. Você provavelmente já viu essa imagem dessa estranha geringonça voadora. Hoje vamos falar do projeto 1794. Documentos desclassificados em 2012 contam a história do projeto 1794, que custou um total de 10 milhões de dólares. Apresento para vocês o Avrocar. Essa estranha aeronave em forma de disco voador foi projetada para viajar nas mais altas altitudes e em alta velocidade, marcando o início de uma nova era militar. No entanto, não funcionou. Os pilotos simplesmente odiavam voar nessa coisa e disseram que pilotar isso era semelhante a equilibrar-se em uma bola de futebol. O ano era 1952 e a Guerra Fria estava a todo vapor. Tanto a paranoia comunista quanto a mania de ficção científica varreram a nação americana. Avistamentos de OVNIs estavam se espalhando como uma epidemia nos Estados Unidos. Nesse ano surgiu o Avrocar, um avião de decolagem e pouso vertical, desenvolvido no Canadá pela Avro Aircraft, como parte de um projeto militar secreto dos Estados Unidos realizado nos primeiros anos da Guerra Fria. O Avrocar pretendia explorar o efeito Coanda, que é a tendência de um jato de fluido ser atraído para uma superfície próxima, fornecendo sustentação e empuxo na forma de um único turborotor, soprando o escapamento da borda em forma de disco. O veículo estava destinado a ser tripulado por duas pessoas, em cabines separadas, e o exército planejava usar a nave como uma espécie de jeep voador. No ar o Avrocar lembrava um disco voador. Dois protótipos foram construídos como veículos de teste. No entanto, em testes de voo, o Avrocar provou ter problemas de estabilidade e de propulsão não resolvidos. O disco voador americano mostrou-se imensamente difícil de voar, com controles muito sensíveis. Depois de várias modificações sem sucesso, o financiamento acabou e o projeto foi cancelado em setembro de 1961. O primeiro Avrocar acabou se tornando o um modelo de teste de túnel de vento na NASA até 1966, quando foi doado ao Museu Nacional do Ar e do Espaço, em Sweetland, Maryland, onde acumulava poeira e começava a se desfazer. Existe uma réplica em escala real do Avrocar no Museu de Aviação do Canadá Ocidental, em Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canadá. Ele agora se encontra em exposição no Museu da Força Aérea Americana. É claro que nem todo mundo acreditou que o projeto foi realmente encerrado em 1961. E os teóricos da conspiração em todo o mundo acham que os discos voadores vistos nos céus hoje podem ser simplesmente modelos recentes de Avrocars. Por mais improvável que pareça, isso poderia oferecer uma explicação melhor para os inúmeros avistamentos de naves espaciais em forma de disco. E você o que acha? Esses OVNIs das mais variadas formas vistos nos céus em todo o mundo seriam obra de americanos? Comente, dê a sua opinião. Inscreva-se no canal.
was devoted to achieving a system in which the power required to operate the focusing control ring was compatible with the pneumatic power available from pilot and gyro stabilizer inputs. Tethered and free flights which followed were directed toward increasing the stability of the vehicle in the ground cushion and increasing the stable height of the ground cushion. Development of the new control system resulted in a marked improvement in attitude stability, control sense, and response rate. At a height of three feet and at forward speeds up to 20 knots, the vehicle no longer displayed the previous tendency to oscillate after pilot inputs, and short, stable flights with hands off were now possible. The height at which the ground cushion tends to become unstable, now known as the critical height, was found to occur at the point where the simple annular jet formed near the ground changes to the focus jet formed at increased height. Any change of attitude with the aircraft at this critical height causes the jet to become focused on the upgoing edge while remaining unfocused on the downgoing edge with resultant hysteresis. An additional, more powerful central jet was added to improve ground cushion stability. It was found, however, that an increase in ground cushion stability was accompanied by a decrease in control power, and the final configuration represented a compromise between the two requirements. Tests were also performed to establish the stabilizing effect of the gyro stabilizer, and it was determined that signals resulting from small changes of attitude were being lost due to system friction and control ring hinge moment. It was apparent at this point that some form of assist was required to transmit stabilizing signals from the gyro to the control ring, and design of a pneumatic booster was commenced. At Ames Research Center, the first vehicle was now ready for installation in the 40 by 80 foot subsonic tunnel. Here, tests would be performed 
to determine the transition trajectory from hovering both in the ground cushion and in free air. These tests were all performed using the focusing ring control system which had resulted in the most successful free flights on the vehicle at the Avro test facility. The variable mount permitted testing to be carried out at heights up to 12 feet. Flight tests on the second vehicle were discontinued to permit introduction of the pneumatic control boost system. This involved the introduction of six sensing nozzles at the base of the central control shaft to monitor six pneumatic actuators mechanically connected to the control ring. The base of the shaft was now secured by a flexure and only a small travel was required to transmit gyro-stabilizing signals to the actuators operating the control ring. Functional and frequency response tests were carried out with the pneumatic system pressurized from an external supply. A variable speed mechanical shaker was used to excite the control column and measurements of control ring motion were made using potentiometers connected to a continuous trace recorder. Subsequently, the tests were repeated with engines operating and the system pressurized by engine bleed air. Tethered tests were performed to permit final checking of the power boosted control system before free flying was resumed. Flights with the pneumatically boosted control system showed a marked improvement over the previous configuration. Stabilizing signals from the gyro were now quite apparent. The pilot reported that the feel of the aircraft was better with the new system and that precise positioning without excessive effort was now possible. In summary, development of the vehicle resulted in a gradual improvement from the relatively unstable first flight requiring rapid pilot inputs through various applications of the spoiler control system, which was abandoned due to lift loss with control application, and ultimately to the introduction of the focusing control ring, which resulted in the most significant improvement to date. In the most recent configuration, with the addition of the pneumatic control boost, the vehicle displayed stable flight characteristics at a height of 3 feet and at speeds up to 30 knots. The wind tunnel test data showed, however, that the focusing ring control, though it had been developed for satisfactory hovering, was not good enough for forward flight and that fairly extensive modifications were required to add an improved forward flight control system. Testing was therefore discontinued until the two vehicles could be modified in readiness for further wind tunnel and flight test programs.